So, ladies and gentlemen, right here in front of us we have a horse digestive system. It is different from the video that you saw um, because this is a preserved specimen. The one in the video that I asked you to watch was a fresh specimen. As for the size of this horse, I'm not exactly sure, but it would probably be comparable to the one that we saw in the video. Uh, it's not huge, obviously, um, but it's not a tiny Shetland pony either. Um, when we're talking about the size of the digestive system, um, we said how big is it in a human? 30 feet. Uh -huh, 30 feet. Obviously, there is more than 30 feet of intestine here for the horse. The uh, intestine is going to vary in size based upon the species of this animal. Um, and the actual makeup of the intestine will change with the type of diet that it has. Not only does the dentition, what does dentition mean? Teeth. teeth. Not only does the type of teeth and quantity of teeth change with the diet, but so does the intestine. Um, so the three main types of diet that we have are herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores. Herbivores are the only ones that are going to eat vegetation. They only eat primary producers. So they eat plants. A horse is a herbivore. We also have carnivores, such as lions and dogs and tigers. Uh, those only eat meat. And so their teeth are very sharp. Um, and pointy for ripping and shredding. A herbivore's teeth, like this horse, are very flat for grinding, uh, for grinding up that cellulose, the plant-based material. And we are omnivorous. We have a combination of both. So we have both the sharp ones and the grinding ones for our uh, dentition, for our different type. As is our diet and our uh, actual intestines, they're a mixed bag as well for both um, the cellulose-based life and also the carnivorous meat-based life. So we have the best of both worlds. Okay, um, so in the mouth we start with mastication. What does mastication mean? It's a chemical and mechanical breakdown of food within the oral cavity. So mastication, once again, means the oral, uh, in the oral cavity, the chemical and um, mechanical breakdown of food. So with chewing, we're moving the mandible, our lower jaw, which moves our teeth, our tongue moves to move the food around the mouth. The salivary glands produce the saliva, which contains the mucin and the amylase, which mix in with the food to make the food bolus, so then it can be swallowed. And it will go down the esophagus. Now, remember the back of the throat is the pharynx, P-H-A-R-Y-N-X. Um, the pharynx, the back of the throat, is going to um, be the separation between the, uh, or the the area where the food and the air separates between the trachea and the esophagus. Uh, the esophagus, remember, has got sphincters. A sphincter is a band of muscles that run um, cross-directional to the length of which the tube is going. So it's like a valve and it shuts off the flow of food down through the esophagus. Remember, though, that we have the epiglottis, which shuts off the flow of food from the trachea so that we don't asp um, aspirate and become hypoxic. Ooh, such good words. Hope you know the meaning. <coughs> nod, nod, wink, wink, yes, okay. All right, so these sphincters, we don't know the meaning? Can you repeat that last sentence? Uh -huh. As, um, to um, aspirate means to inhale into your lungs something that shouldn't be there such as food, the epiglottis has failed from sealing off the trachea. That's why you should never eat with your mouth, uh, or talk with your mouth full. Um, and um, hypoxic, great word, means lack of oxygen. Okay, so the food comes down the esophagus. Now this esophagus here actually has um, a number of stronger sphincters in the horse than in a human. And this is because they eat with their heads down and they have to be able to swallow with their heads down. 
So because of that, they actually have more uh, stronger sphincters that prevents the food from going back because of gravity, because their head is lower um, than their stomach at that point. Um, and uh, so it prevents them from being able to throw up. Now, you may think, oh, that's a wonderful thing, not being able to throw up. But is it? Why is it dangerous for this horse not to be able to throw up? If it were to ingest something deadly like a virus or bacteria, it wouldn't be able to get rid of it. Very nice. So um, the answer is that if it ingests, it takes into its body by um, eating something that is poisonous, um, let's say it eats a, a berry that it shouldn't have done, that is poisonous and irritating to the stomach, it has no way of getting rid of it. The only way it can get rid of it is through pooping it out. How long does food take to process through a horse? Two days. Six days. Sorry? Like four to six days. Four to six days. Yeah, it can take up to a week for this food to pass through. So you can imagine that this poor horse has got all of these toxins in its body for that length of time. Obviously, um, the speed at which it's going to pass through its intestine is going to be quicker because it's bad for it. Uh, but the food will be stuck in, or the bad toxins will be stuck in its system, and more will be absorbed, and it will become sicker. So how do they help a horse if it's been uh, ingesting the wrong food? Anybody know? No, they don't have to cut it open, which is a good thing. With cows, they can actually cut open. They've actually got cows that have got plexiglass on the sides of their stomachs, and they can open and close to see how their stomachs work. It's pretty awesome. I would like that. But um, the, um, the way in which they actually help a horse, the same way they would help a human, is with an NG tube, nasal gastric tube. So they basically shove a tube up your nose, down the back of the pharynx, because remember the nasal cavity is connected to the oral cavity, and it will go down the esophagus, in through to the stomach, and they can then pump the contents out. Anybody ever heard of an NG tube or pumping your stomach? Yes, when do you happen, when does that happen? Alcohol poisoning or drug poisoning or ingesting the wrong type of food if you have a very, very severe case of um, food poisoning, they may need to pump your stomach. And that's how they do it. They stick a tube up your nose, down the back of your throat. Um, you're awake through this whole procedure and it is incredibly unpleasant. And I know I've had one. I had an obstruction and they had to stick a tube up my nose. And it is very, very unpleasant. Do not wish it on anyone. Um, so an NG tube uh, is what they'll use for a horse as well. So they can actually go from your nose and connect to your stomach. It seems a weird thing to be able to connect but it's probably the easiest thing to do for them to be able to empty the contents of the stomach. So vomiting is very important. And we talked about this previously, how vomiting um, is important for getting rid of food or anything that one ingests that is uh, bad, like if it's got bacteria or toxins into it. And remember that the stomach has to contract at great force and velocity to overcome the sphincters within the esophagus to get out the um, food or uh, the uh, toxins to get it out of the body. Okay, so this here is the esophagus, and I'll show you if you can see that this is the sphincter that is going around. If you look up, as I'm passing it in your direction, you can see how it looks like a cutoff and it closes it up. And that's basically the upper esophageal sphincter. Now, you may go, oh, but what's this? Now, this is quite interesting. This here is a blood vessel. <coughs> yes, I know, it's pretty awesome, really. They're quite thick. Now, this is very muscular. This esophagus is very muscular. There is actually muscles within the rings of this blood vessel. And if you can look in there, I don't know if you can see, but there's little holes coming off the um, lower side, and that's where it branches off to other blood vessels. 
So this is probably the descending aorta, a really thick, strong blood vessel. Okay, what do you think this flap is right here? Anybody idea? I'll give you a hint. This is the diaphragm. Now you can see that this piece is really strong. I mean, I'm giving it a really good tug here. It's a very, very strong muscular uh, separation. And where do you notice the esophagus? It goes through the um, diaphragm. So the esophagus goes through the diaphragm and will end up at this stomach. So let me see if I can access it here. This whole section here between my hands, this is the stomach. Now, in the um, video, this is the stomach here to here, you can see. In the video, it said that the stomach was equivalent to that of a rugby ball. Do me a favor. Hold it up over here for me, so everybody even on the video land can see. This is a rugby ball. This is a proper official size rugby ball. That is about the size of a horse's stomach. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so on the inside of the stomach, I don't know if you can see, but I've opened it up and you should be able to see that the inside is wrinkly. And the inside is not smooth or flat, but the wrinkles in here are the rouge. R-U-G-A-E. The rouge are there to increase the surface area and friction for holding the food that is inside the stomach. So we've now chewed our food. Remember, we have to chew it a certain amount of time to allow for the chemical and mechanical breakdown to occur. We've pushed it down with our tongue to the pharynx. The food bolus now goes with peristalsis, that rhythmic contractions of the esophagus to push the food down with the help of gravity, um, or in the horse's case, against gravity. That peristalsis is really strong in order to get the food bolus into the stomach through the two sphincters, the upper and the lower esophageal sphincter. Now the stomach is going to move and contract, and it moves and grinds up the food extensively within the stomach. So this food bolus is now going to be broken down mechanically, but it doesn't end there. It also is going to be broken down chemically, and the chemicals that are coming out of the stomach are secreted by the lining of the stomach. And these chemicals are hydrochloric acid and lots of enzymes. The purpose for the acid is to help break down the chemical breakdown of the food as well as to kill off any organisms or bacteria that might be within the stomach because of the ingestion of food. Bacteria are ubiquitous. That's a fantastic SAT word. What does ubiquitous mean? Everywhere. You, bacteria are everywhere. You have millions and millions of bacteria all over you, inside you, in your every air that you breathe in, everywhere we have bacteria on everything you touch, on everything that you eat, bacteria. And so we need to have this acid to help the killing off of the bacteria that we ingest, as well as the breakdown of these macromolecules into smaller molecules for us to use as building blocks. Now that acid, is so strong that it digests and eats away your own stomach lining. The stomach lining is actively being replaced from behind. It is actively being replaced um, so that it's, you continuously have a stomach <coughs> lining. You replace your stomach lining every two to three hours quite quickly. All right, so I told you that I hate gum. And this is my reasoning why I hate gum. One, you look like a cow chewing the cud. Constantly chewing is really unpleasant. Second, I can't stand the smell of it. It's just disgusting. Third, I think it is thoroughly unhealthy for you. So here's the deal. You're chewing. The chewing initiates your salivary glands. The salivary glands produce lots of saliva. But when it gets swallowed, all of this saliva and the action of chewing, it initiates also more enzymes and acid being produced by your stomach lining. So as you're chewing, you're stimulating your stomach to start producing more acid. So the stomach's like, okay, I'm ready, send it down, I'm ready, spin down the food, I'm ready.
ready to digest and nothing comes down because you're still just chewing gum. So what happens to all that extra acid? What does it eat away? It eats away your stomach rather than it eating away the food. So it has more opportunity of digesting yourself than the food that it's meant to do. That's why I think gum is so bad. Now, why is it going to be a problem if you have all of this digestion of yourself? Well, it then leads to the possibility of ulcers and GERD. Oh, all right. Ulcers and GERD, G-E-R-D. Let's talk about ulcers first. Now, ulcers, um, when you think about ulcers, you tend to think about people that get them that are in high-stress jobs. Um, high stress, they don't eat properly. Like people that are um, like Wall Street workers or people that are um, constantly on the go, they don't have a regular eating habit, they're drinking, they're smoking, they're high stress, more acid production, less food production or less food intake at regular intervals, um, meaning that they're probably more likely to have an ulcer. An ulcer is basically the bacteria is eating away um, and the acid is eating away at your stomach lining. Bacteria then get into that little pocket where the acid has eroded the stomach lining. The bacteria stay in there and bacteria are not meant to stay in your stomach and they start eating away further, eating away into the actual stomach um, skin itself, if you will, or actually into the muscle of the stomach as it goes deeper in. This can cause pain, like you have a lot of nerves in there and it will cause pain. But then you take an antacid, Tums, uh, Maalox, Pepto-Bismol, and you feel a little better. But it's only masking the symptoms, because what it's doing is it's neutralizing the acid. Because you've eroded this hole in your stomach, the acid that gets in there is going to make it really painful. So, as it's eroding, the bacteria is in there, it can cause pus to come in, you've got acid building up in that extra area. You take some Maalox, you take Pepto-Bismol, it neutralizes the acid and it feels a little better. But this is only like putting a band-aid on a broken leg. It is not fixing the problem. Now, Maalox, Tums, um, Pepto-Bismol, so on and so forth, are not going to want me to tell you this because they, they have a multi-million, if not multi-billion dollar industry. If you have an ulcer, it is typically caused by a particular bacterium called Helipyloribacter, H. pylori, P-Y-L-O-R-I, pylori, um, bacter. Healy pylori bacter. And this bacterium loves to sit into the pockets of your stomach from the erosion. Now the only way to get rid of this bacterium is a course of antibiotics. And it happens to be a free antibiotics at Publix. Maalox does not want you to know this because they want you to keep buying their products but you will be continually buying their products because again, it's only masking the symptoms, not curing the effect. How do they test to see if you have this bacterium? They do a stool test. You basically go home and poop and they take a sample of your poop and send it off to the lab and they will look to see if you have this H. pylori in your stool. Stool is another word for poop. If you do, it's a quick course of antibiotics and you are right as rain and it fixes it. But here's the problem, your stomach may be producing a lot of acid and so as a result they may actually give you a prescription for a, an acid blocker to make less acid being produced in your stomach. Now, the second thing condition with this acid and overproduction is GERD, G-E-R-D. That is Gastrointestinal esophageal reflux disorder. Gastrointestinal esophageal reflux disorder, also known as reflux. It can also be, in layman's terms, in short episodes, heartburn. Now, does your heart actually burn? The answer is no, but it feels like it. 
There are people that have called 911 saying, I am having a heart attack. They go to the hospital, they're hooked up to the EEG machines, um, and uh, they're looking at them and like, no, you're not having a heart attack. What was the last thing you ate? And they're like, oh, well, I was just at the diner and I had a double cheeseburger with chili fries and I had a milkshake and I had some um, uh, key lime pie and chocolate cake. And they'll be like, ah, there's your problem. One, your diet. Two, you overindulged and it caused your stomach to be enlarged, which could then cause that lower esophageal sphincter, the one that's at the base of the esophagus to the stomach, to become leaky. So it opens up. Now all of that food is bubbling around inside that stomach as well as all that acid and some of those fumes of acid then go up the esophagus. The esophagus is a neutral area and to have burning acid fumes inside the esophagus causes erosion and it causes pain, like severe pain. Again, Maalox Tums, it helps to neutralize and calm the acid. But for, cons that's just for if you like have temporary overindulgence. But if you are continually getting bouts of this burning heartburn, because remember the esophagus goes up behind the heart, and so you feel it right here in, in the middle of your um, sternum, right? Um, if you're having consistent feelings of that, the problem is that it can erode away the esophagus and can cause scarring and can lead to a Barrett's esophagus where it's now scar tissue rather than beautiful muscle that's moving your food along. Um, so, what do they do? They put you on, basically, a pill that reduces the amount of acid within your stomach, and so therefore less acid, less problems of it bubbling up into your esophagus and eroding it. Um, they have uh, Nexium. You heard of the purple pill? That helps to reduce the erosion in your esophagus, calm the acid down, and help you to maintain the um, acid levels. So that's a good thing. Now, pregnancy, or... Oh. Ladies, have you ever heard of women with uh, late stage pregnancy getting terrible heartburn? That is because when you're pregnant, all of your intestines have to shift up and out of the way to make room for this developing baby. Oh, so as it pushes up, the stomach pushes up, it can make that lower esophageal sphincter pressure on it, it makes it leaky and opens up that um, opens up the esophagus from the acid in your stomach and causes erosion. So second to third semester, late second, most of third, it is typical for women to get some terrible heartburn. So tums in your purse is a very good idea. And there's nothing that can be done for that, um, typically. Um, until you've actually delivered and then everything shifts back to normal and then typically that a lower esophageal sphincter is going to constrict and go back to normal. So the joys of pregnancy to look forward to. One of the many. All right, so. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Anybody know what this ear-shaped thing is? Sorry? No, not mesentery, but I love the fact that you've used that word. We'll get to that. This here is the spleen. Now, typically, on a human, your spleen is located retroperitoneal, another one of my favorite words, meaning it's situated behind other organs. It's tucked down the side on the left-hand side um, by your stomach and uh, pancreas, and it's just nestled in on the side. It typically is an oblong organ, and the purpose of the spleen is peculiar. In infants, the spleen is used to manufacture blood cells and basically starts promoting your blood production. And then as it gets older and currently now, it's used in immunity. So it helps, particularly within the endocrine system, uh, sorry, the lymphatic system, I beg your pardon, in the lymphatic system, it helps with the circulation of lymph, that fluid, um, as well as the um, holding and keeping of all of the antibodies and your basically recipe for fighting off infection if it comes. So when you get um, an infection, the vaccinations that you had as a child, all of that information from the vaccines is stored within the spleen and then they can then start production of the uh, antibodies to fight off the infection. Now you can live without a spleen. Spleens can get ruptured, particularly 
If you have car accidents, that's one of the biggest things. If you have in, um, damage to your abdominal region, they look for spleen lacerations or spleen um, uh, removal if it's bleeding. Uh, you can live without a spleen, but it is more likely, therefore, that you will get sick and get every common cold, every flu, um, because, again, your immune system is then depleted slightly. Okay? So, we've gone schnarf, 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 we've done all of that. Okay, so um, esophagus, stomach. The stomach, as we said, is going to move all of that food, grind it up with chemical and mechanical breakdown until it forms chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. Chyme is food glue. So it's now liquidy, it's been broken down, it's been mixed with enzymes, mixed with acid, and then there is a secondary sphincter, it's called the pyloric sphincter. The pyloric sphincter will control the amount of chyme that pushes out of the stomach and into the duodenum, or duodenum, I don't mind how you say it. The duodenum's first job is going to be to neutralize that chyme because it's very acidic from the stomach. The second job of the duodenum is to allow for all of the other digestive juices that are coming in from our accessory organs to mix in with that chyme and continue the breakdown. The duodenum is the site for the largest amount of chemical breakdown within the digestive system. The small intestine, thank you, the small intestine is the site for 90% uh, of uh, absorption of nutrients and therefore the chemical breakdown of those nutrients so that they can be absorbed. The small intestine is made up of three parts, the duodenum, the, ju the jejunum, and the ileum, okay, in that order. The duodenum, jejunum, ileum. So the duodenum is the site for where the majority of that chemical breakdown occurs because the three axillary organs, accessory additional organs, dump their digestive juices into it. Now let's discuss those because they're very, very important. The first one we're going to talk about is the liver. Now this is a small ugh, this is a small portion of the liver. It's been cut off. Now the liver is an incredibly hard organ. Are you ready? Listen. It's solid. It is incredibly solid hard organ. This hard organ is probably one of the biggest glands in the entire body. It weighs just over three pounds. The brain weighs just slightly less than the liver. So it's a really big organ. When you open up the abdominal pelvic cavity, the biggest and first thing that you see is the liver. Now it tends to be really dark red. That is because it has three main functions. And one of the main functions is to filter blood. So it is incredibly filled with blood. This blood needs to be filtered and to get rid of any toxins or any debris or waste that might be in the blood. And what toxins are we talking about? Anything from multivitamins, herbal supplements, um, drugs, alcohol, Advil, Tylenol, anything, prescription medications, Anything that you put into your body has to go through the liver to get detoxified. So anything at all. Um, so let's talk about um, Advil and Tylenol for a moment. What is the recommended daily dose for Advil or Tylenol? No more than four in a 24-hour period. Uh, yes, uh, four is safe, six is uh, maximum. Uh -huh. Um, so you can take up to six tablets in a 24-hour period for both Advil and Tylenol. Um, it is 350 milligrams of acetaminophen. Acetaminophen is the active ingredient in Tylenol. Um, or ibuprofen is the active ingredient in Advil or Motrin. They are two different um, substances and they act differently on the body. Um, acetaminophen, Tylenol, is a fantastic, it was one of the first drugs that really helped with pain relief, 
and with fever reduction is a fantastic um, drug to, to keep in your back pocket, but one that one should never, ever, ever abuse. That is because if you abuse taking too much Tylenol or Advil, it is going to affect your liver. Now this is one organ you cannot live without. Um, the liver functions, as I said, for threefold. The biggest one is that it detoxifies and cleans the blood. The liver is amazing and it self-regenerates. It has regenerative properties. These cells regrow and can actually regrow the liver to a certain point. You've ever heard of alcoholics pickling their liver? It's called cirrhosis of the liver. Cirrhosis, um, it begins with a C. Um, cirrhosis of the liver, it's where the liver has been so abused that it scars. And because it scars, it can no longer self-regenerate and self-heal. It's a very sad state of affair. Now that does not mean that if you go and have a drink that you're going to scar your liver. It typically is from people who have been alcoholics and that have been putting too much in their body that it can no longer um, differentiate and kind of cleanse the liver, it's, uh, cleanse the blood itself. Now that liver is quite impressive. Do you know why they say you shouldn't drink alcohol until you're 25? Two reasons. One, the liver doesn't actually make the enzymes needed effectively to um, break down alcohol until you're about 25 years old. And secondly, your frontal lobe is not developed enough to be able to manage the effects of alcohol. And it can actually affect your brain and liver development if one uses alcohol prior to 25. And obviously, uh, in excessive amounts would be really bad, right? Um, the, we talked Tylenol, we talked cirrhosis, um, if the liver does by chance break down, as in it's no longer working for whatever reason, and it could be due to infection, there is a big infection called hepatitis, have you heard of this? There's hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E, different strains of this virus. Hepatitis is transferred sexually, it's transferred medically, it's transferred through um, bodily fluids, um, depending upon which hepatitis strain there is. There are actually vaccinations for a few of these strains, um, and, um, but one does have to be careful. Um, so hepatitis can affect the liver and stop it from functioning. If the liver stops functioning, you could end up with jaundice. Have you ever heard of jaundice? Babies are not the only ones that can become jaundice. Basically, you go yellow, like your skin goes this color yellow, your eyes go this color yellow, yellow, bright yellow. Um, and that is because there is, um, the liver is no longer able to break down um, the blood cells particularly, and the bilirubin, which is part of the blood cells, builds up within the blood in the tissue, and therefore you turn oompa loompa, you turn yellow. It is not a good sign. Yellow is never a good sign. Um, what can be done? Livers can, as I said, regenerate. And the liver is actually made up of two lobes. There is a large lobe and a small lobe. You can actually donate one of your lobes, the smaller lobe, to a person. You can actually donate part of your liver and they put it in the person and it regenerates into a larger liver in the recipient and you as the donor will actually regrow part of your liver. Not back to the full size it was, but you grow back quite a bit of it. So it's quite impressive. No, you may not be able to re-donate multiple times. You can't just keep growing livers. That would be quite fun though. Um, but uh, it's quite a, a nice idea is that if a relative or if a family member or if somebody in itself needed a, a liver, you can actually do a liver transplant where you can actually donate part of it. For cadavers, you can actually donate um, your liver to two people. So if you are an organ donor, um, the recipient can actually be two people to receive a liver, which is quite good. Okay, um, second purpose for the uh, liver is for storage. So the liver helps stores 
nutrients, particularly proteins, vitamins, and some lipids. But the liver is used for storage. And the third reason, which comes back to digestive, is it produces bile, B-I-L-E. Now, bile is used to break down fat, break down lipids, specifically. This is the enzyme that's used to break down lipids. Um, the bile leaves the liver via the hepatic duct, H-E-P-T-A, hepatic, T-I-C, hepatic duct. Um, HEPA is to do with liver. Have you ever heard of a HEPA filter? There's, you have maybe in your air conditioning, you have HEPA filters. That means they're super filtration systems. So HEPA means filtering. HEPA uh, to do with the liver, hepatic duct. And that bile goes into two places. One, it hits our second organ, which is the gallbladder. And secondly, it goes down the common bile duct into the duodenum to help break down the lipid there. Now, let's mention the gallbladder. The gallbladder is the second of our auxiliary organs. The gallbladder is used to store bile. It stores and concentrates the bile up to make it really potent. So let's say you eat a salad that doesn't have very much lipid in it. Your gallbladder is not going to be engaged. It's, there's enough bile produced by your liver in order to break down and digest the lipid that might be in your salad. But let's say you have a bacon double cheeseburger with chili um, cheddar corn fries or whatever they're called, right? Lots of fat that's involved in that, yes? Your bile produced by your liver is not going to be nearly enough. And so as a result, your gallbladder, which is a tiny little green sac nestled underneath the lower lobes of your liver, is going to squeeze. And it squeezes out this concentrated bile. It goes down the cystic duct. Yep, the cystic duct into the common bile duct to put this really strong, potent bile into the duodenum to break down that extra fat. Now, common ailments with the gallbladder. Because it is concentrating and storing, it can actually start producing stones. Now, have you ever heard of gallstones? Really painful condition. Um, the pain is felt in the epigastric region, um, so right underneath the curvature of your uh, rib cage, slightly to the right hand side, because your liver is located on the right. The pain radiates up, it can radiate to your back, and you will happen to notice that it happens after you eat something fatty, because the bile is trying to push out of your gallbladder and it may be hampered by a stone. These stones can be made of two main things, of bilirubin or uh, bile, I beg your pardon, bile or um, cholesterol. Um, and uh, these... Bile stones? Bilirubin stones. Bilirubin, I was right. Um, and uh, cholesterol. These are the two main types of stones. So it kind of concentrates it up and stores it there and they form these stones and they can actually block the passageway of the bile out of the gallbladder. They remove the gallbladder if this occurs and it's called a cholecystectomy. Great word. A cholecystectomy is the removal of the gallbladder. A cholecystectomy can be done uh, laparoscopically or laparotomy with a laparotomy. Laparoscopically means it's done keyhole surgery. They stick three probes into your abdomen, one through your belly button, 
one up in the top left corner and one down in the bottom right corner and they put three probes in. They fill the abdomen up with carbon dioxide through these probes. They use another one as a camera and they use the other ones as like pincers. They go in, they cut it, seal it off, cauterize it, clamp it and pull it out the little opening and it's done very quickly. They do these all the time. Um, you're out the hospital same day pretty much. If they do a laparotomy, that means they've opened you up and made an incision, a large incision. The incision's about mm, four inches, thereabouts, and it's done uh, horizontally, across, uh, uh, lower than the liver. And they go in and they remove it, cut it off. You're probably there overnight at least, if not two days, and there's a slower recovery because they've had to cut through muscle. A cholecystectomy is the removal of the gallbladder. Now, if you have no gallbladder, you can live a perfectly happy life. I do not have a gallbladder. Mine was removed a number of years ago, um, and I live perfectly healthy. The only difference is that I don't eat much fat because I don't have the ability to digest high fat content because the gallbladder has gone. Um, and that's probably a good thing. No huge fat in your diet is a good thing. You don't want to be constantly eating um, chili fries and bacon and double cheeseburgers because that's not healthy for you, nutritionally valuable. So there's our two main organs, our axillaries which are the liver and the gallbladder. The third one is the pancreas. The pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ and it sits behind the stomach. It is oblong shaped, fat at one end, tailed is thinner. This head, the fatter end, actually nestles into the curve of the duodenum. So it's behind the stomach, there's the uh, head of the pancreas, is nestled into the curve of the duodenum and the tail of it goes in this direction. Two major functions with the pancreas. The pancreas produces a lot of pancreatic enzymes which help to break down food. That's the digestive part. But the other major reason for the pancreas is for the production of insulin. Insulin helps to regulate blood sugar levels and it helps to allow for the sugar to go into the cells rather than staying within the blood. If you produce too much insulin, then you do not have enough, uh, wait, too much <coughs> insulin, there is too much sugar within your cells and you don't have enough that's circulating your body. So that's why people who are diabetic that produce too much insulin carry sugar with them or like little candies in their pockets so that they, if they feel they're getting woozy, they can actually eat a um, candy to put the blood sugar back in to counteract the overproduction of insulin. They are hypoglycemic. Cool. If you are hyperglycemic, meaning that you do not produce enough insulin, then you have too much sugar that is floating around in your body, in your blood. This is a problem because it can affect your arteries, it can affect your blood vessels, and it can also affect your nerves, causing the nerves to die. And so it can actually cause miscirculation and um, less of feeling, particularly within the extremities. So diabetes is a terrible condition and for a number of reasons, it can actually be prevented. There are some that is a kind of a genetic propensity for it, but diet and exercise are going to be involved highly within diabetes. We're seeing an increase in diabetes um, in our youth because there is more Xbox and staying inside to play on computers and playstations and whatnot, less going outside being active, and more ability to eat refined sugars um, that have the quick release of sugar that stays within the blood system, and therefore our pancreas cannot produce enough uh, insulin in order to deal with it, and then we have issues with diabetes. It's very sad. Okay, so pancreas, 
liver, gallbladder are three accessory organs. Um, the pancreas produces the pancreatic enzymes that go down the pancreatic duct, the first name that's actually common sense. And it goes all, so the pancreatic duct, the cystic duct, and the hepatic duct all drain into one common bile duct. The common bile duct then flows into the duodenum. The duodenum then goes, so stomach, and it goes to the duodenum. Oh my goodness, here we go. Stomach, here's the duodenum. Uh, I've got to find it. Where did he go? He's going this way. All right, here we go. And then it goes into the duodenum. It goes into the small intestine. Now, the small intestine is small just by um, thickness of the um, walls of the intestine, not by length. So I'm looking for some good small intestine. This is all the small intestine here. Do you see? It's quite thin. In comparison, this is the large intestine. You can see the thickness of the walls of the small intestine much thinner than the thickness of the large intestine. So this small intestine here is um, very plentiful. In fact, this contains two-thirds the length of the intestine in a human. It is slightly different in a horse. A horse has a um, small intestine here for the breakdown of quick release energy. So the first bit of cellulose that they eat, they're gonna have a quick release of energy before it passes on into the um, large intestine. It doesn't stay very long within the small intestine, hours, but it spends days within the large intestine, okay? Now, the small intestines, the thickness of the walls is very important because um, it needs to be thin in order to get the nutrients to be absorbed into the neighboring um, blood vessels. Now, what I'm doing is called running the bowel. As you run, if you're looking for like intestinal blockages or problems within a human bowel, this is what they do. They run the bowel through your hand like this to actually look to see and ascertain if there's any problems within the intestine and they can look to see where issues are. What you can see in between, hopefully you can see, are all of these beautiful structures, and it looks like a drum. Can you see this? It looks like a drum. And you can see that there are, you can hear, this is the um, blood vessels and nerves that are running through. This is called mesentery. Mesentery is a connective tissue that has blood vessels and nerve tissues that run through it. Now, the reason why we have an extensive blood supply is for twofold. One, this intestine is constantly moving. The nerves are stimulating the peristalsis to move the food along to make sure that it's being decomposed and digested. So that's why we have nerves, to stimulate the movement of the um, peristalsis, this rhythmic contractions, to move the food along. But the blood vessels are there in order to extract the nutrients from the small intestine. The small intestine um, has a very special way of breaking down the food. Inside the small intestine, it looks like velvet. I'm trying to find my opening I already have. Um, so it looks like velvet inside because there are loads of projections. Here we go. Can you see? It looks velvety inside. And you can see it's also wrinkly as well to help with the gripping. Show it this way. The inside of it is velvety because there are lots of projections called villi. Villi are finger-like projections that are there to increase the surface area so that as the food is passing through, these finger-like projections are able to <laughs> absorb all of the nutrients that are going there. Now these finger-like projections, if you see, like if I put my hand together like this, you can see that the surface area is this much. But as a fingers, I now have all of this extra surface area that allows for more nutrients to be absorbed, so hence the villi. 
Okay, celiacs. Celiacs is a disease that is because they cannot ingest gluten. Uh, you may be gluten intolerant. Gluten is found within, uh, it's a protein found within wheat, barley and malt products specifically. It's found in other places as well, but those are the main things. So people that have celiacs can't go out and have pizza, regular pizza and a beer because it's made of gluten is in it. Now the problem with people that have celiacs or that are, are gluten intolerant is that this protein comes in and it lays over the villi and stops them from being able to absorb. It actually inflames and reduces those villi and so the absorptive rate of person that has celiacs that's ingested gluten is much less. They can actually become malnourished because of this, this inability to absorb the food. Okay? Um, Let's go back to mesentery a moment. Now, do you see on this underneath side, now I've had this horse for a while and so it's become a little disheveled, but you can still see this beautiful mesh of um, mesentery. And it is different from the mesentery that's in between the loops of bowel. This mesentery is the same thing. It's a connective tissue with blood vessels and with um, nerves. And this mesentery that goes over the top of the entirety of the digestive system is there to hold it in place. Like the peritoneal uh, membrane, we talked about those, this mesentery lays on top of the intestine to hold it in place. Now, for some unknown reason, particularly like in large breed dogs, um, and in some humans, for some unknown reason, the mesentery can actually move and it can actually strangle and attach to uh, and strangle up or twist and hold together some of the loops of bowel. And this becomes an obstruction. Some of that mesentery can go around and clasp it. This can become an obstruction. This is very dangerous and very painful. If there is an obstruction or even a partial obstruction, the food is still wanting to get through and pass through the intestine, but it can't. There's a roadblock. The body's first defense is to vomit and diarrhea profusely to empty the system as much as possible to relieve the stress on the system and hope that the intestine unblocks and goes back. If, however, the intestine is strangulated, this becomes very problematic because this intestine is full of um, uh, waste products, bacteria, um, fecal matter, and as a result, it can inflame and become very large. And if it bursts, that becomes very problematic. Uh, it would be emergency surgery if you have a, a burst um, obstruction. Obstructions typically will result in um, an NG tube or a, um, a, a surgery to remove the obstruction. The... Um, the bowel, the biggest problem with the bowel, the intestine here, is if it is obstructed like this, the blood flow doesn't get to it. Now remember we need blood in order to remove the nutrients, but we also need blood to supply the cells of this intestine. And so if this blood does not flow to the intestine, it can become necrotic, a fantastic word. Necrotic means dead tissue. And if it dies, then this section of the bowel has to be cut out and replunged together. Again, major surgery for that. Necrotic tissue for an obstruction. Let's talk of another thing that can happen. Hernias. Hernias are when you have intestine that pushes up through part of the... Um, uh, membranes and through the body wall. There are some local places that you get uh, hernias, inguinal hernias by your, um, uh, by your groin, umbilical hernias. You get them quite often through your belly button. Pregnant women and people who cough a lot, like if you have a very bad bout of bronchitis or something and you're coughing, 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 that can cause um, a hernia. Um, 
Inguinal hernias happen a lot for people who are lifting weights because there can be an area of weakness and pop out pops your um, intestine and you can see a bulge on in your skin. Um, you can also have a hiatal hernia. A hiatal hernia is where your stomach pushes up through the diaphragm and it's your diaphragm that actually cuts off the circulation to your stomach. They can fix that by pulling it down wrapping the stomach around itself onto the esophagus and stapling it shut. That means that you can't vomit again. Anyways, um, hernias can be typically repaired. Surgically, um, they tend to push it back through where it was, patch up the weakness, and then you're good to go. So an outy belly button does not mean that you have a hernia, but if all of a sudden that this outy pops out to be its enormous nose, because you're either pregnant or because um, you've been coughing too much or lifting lots of weights, it's important to go to the doctor because if a hernia, same way as an obstruction, gets strangulated, it can cause the problems with your intestines and it can kill them. So you must make sure that you get it sorted. Okay, how are we doing? Everybody okay? Excellent. Yes. Yes. So, <clears throat> we get out... Uh, oh, good, good. Excellent. So, small intestine breakdown. 90% of all nutrients and water get absorbed here in the small intestine with that villi uh, absorbing, <coughs> making it go throughout the rest of the body. Now, from there, from the small intestine, the majority of the intestine being small in a human, but in this horse, the majority here, or a large portion of it, not the majority, is going to be this. It will go from the duodenum, jejunum, ileum to the cecum. Now in us, our cecum is really short. But in this horse, it is one of the largest portions of the horse. This is because the gut bacteria, the gut flora, stay within this cecum. And you can see how large it is. It is huge, right? It stays within this cecum for days to break down the cellulose. Because cellulose, the part of the cell plant cell wall that we can't easily digest, needs bacteria to break it down. So this whole cecum here is filled with bacteria to have a slow breakdown of the um, cellulose. And you'll see on the inside, it is very, very wrinkly. The wrinkles, can you see boys? The wrinkles are there to help increase the surface area and to help with moving this food along. It's now becoming a little more, well, a little less food-like and more um, nutrient-based um, and is starting to have a bit of the water also removed. From the cecum, particularly in this organism where it stayed there for a while, it's going down, comes back. It's then going to hit the large intestine. And you can see that this large intestine is really thick. The walls of this vessel are really, really thick. And you can see it is much thicker and stronger than the small intestine. Now, the reason for that is the water here is being removed. Okay, you can see the thickness of this. It's really quite thick and again wrinkly. This is the large intestine. The um, water is being removed in the large intestine and the removal of the water means it's now going to form solid poop. The solidness of this poop is going to mean that it's going to take more force to push it through the intestine rather than liquidy in the small intestine. Hence, it's stronger and thicker. The water needs to be removed in the large intestine before it travels along, traveling, 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 gets stored in the rectum, and then finally out of the anus. And you can see here that this anus, this is the anus right here, is another sphincter. It is similar in structure to this esophageal sphincter here. So the anus is actually a double sphincter that allows for the, um, the constriction of the exit for the 
poop um, so that one doesn't just automatically poop themselves as they go. Talking of poop, we need to discuss poo. Oh, we've got to do all the greatest things, right? Your poo in shape and colour and texture can actually say a lot about your health. You should have well-formed brown J-shaped logs. They should be easy to pass and they shouldn't hurt and you should be going regularly. That does not mean that one should go two, three times a day or every two, three days, but one should attempt to go at least once a day. The process in our digestive system takes about 24 hours, depending upon what you're eating and a good, healthy, balanced meal. It takes about 24 hours to push your digestive system through from ingestion to excretion. However, everybody is different. Everybody poops, everybody needs to poop, but um, the rate at which your digestive system may be different from your person that you're sitting next to. And that's okay, as long as what you're pooping is well-formed and regular in movement. If, however, it is painful to poop, it is hard, it is hard to excrete the poop, it could mean that you are constipated. Constipation is the process of the food staying, or the waste and the, the, the resources staying within your intestine for too long. The longer it stays inside your intestine, the more water is being removed, and so therefore it makes it harder, hence constipation. Conversely, diarrhea means that this is watery poo and the stool has not stayed within the large intestine long enough to have enough water removed. Now these, when this happens, it could mean uh, what you're eating as well as health-wise, you maybe have a complication, some medicines can affect your bowel habits. Um, but if you are all of a sudden going from McDonald's three times a day to a juice cleanse, you can expect that whilst on this juice cleanse, you're going to be on the toilet quite a lot and quite regularly, and you're going to have watery poop. Because of the change in cellulose, the different amounts of cellulose that you have. If you change from white bread, and you eat lots of white bread, all of a sudden you're going to a whole grain seedy bread, you may notice that you have more liquidy or more frequent stool, pooping, diarrhea, because there's more um, roughage and there's more cellulose in that diet. Conversely, if you all of a sudden you've gone from a lovely, healthy, normal, nutritious, balanced diet to eating something that is just stodgy, um, very little carbohydrates, then you could actually get constipated because it's staying in your intestine too long and it's not pushing it through, which is not healthy because A, it's going to hurt your anus and B, it can actually mean that you have more waste and toxins being absorbed into your body. If your poo is bright red, do not panic. First, think have you eaten anything such as beets or any other kind of red food dye? Food dye or natural food dye can actually change the colour of your poop. So if you have bright blue poop, you may have eaten some um, blue Kool-Aid or blue ice cream and it can make your poop bright blue. Uh, if you have red poop, and it is bloody. Again, do not panic. You need to ascertain where the blood is coming from. If you've just had a very hard constipatory kind of poop and it's very solid and it's difficult to get out, you may have injured your anus. That's okay, it heals and it sorts itself out. But if you are continuously, no matter what kind of poop you have, you're having blood on your anus, you may have something known as a hemorrhoid. Hemorrhoids are blood vessels that have pushed out from the rectum into the outer portion of the anus and every time you poop you can irritate and break open the blood vessel and cause you to bleed. They can be surgically removed 
In the olden days, they used to tie rubber bands around the hemorrhoid and cut the blood circulation off, just like they would dock a tail of a sheep, and then it would just fall off naturally. They, t they don't tend to do that as much nowadays, but it is an option. From your doctor, do not try tying a rubber band around your anus. Um, the so hemorrhoids, they could be bleeding from there. But if it is blood and it's not coming from the anus, you may have a small tear in your rectum. Again, that will be something you need to call the doctor and say, hey, just letting you know, and they'll sort it out. If, however, your poo is black and tarry, and it comes out as black, tarry poo, that is a call to the doctor, if not a go to the emergency room, because you will be having intestinal bleeding further up in your digestive system. The likelihood of you ever getting black and tarry poo is minimal, but it's still an interesting fact to know about. So black and tarry means intestinal bleeding higher up in the digestive tract. Yes? Doesn't that happen when like babies are first born? Babies have a black tarry <coughs> poop called meconium. That is their first poop. And that is because um, they don't actually have any food in their intestine. It's just basically all the byproducts of itself. And that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. That was a great question. Thank you. Um, okay, if your poop is oily, brown, and very broken apart and floating, you may have an issue with your liver or gallbladder, or you may have just eaten and ingested a lot of fat. If you are consistently having this mustard brown poop that is oily and not well formed, please call your doctor and explain to them what is happening. Um, and uh, take an account of food that you're eating to them. It will help you along the way. Uh, we talked about food, we talked about poop, we talked about colours. Diverticulitis. Um, diverticulitis is where you get pockets inside your intestine. That can be um, sources where things can get caught. Diverticulitis um, means actually to have a low fiber diet because it's the fiber that gets caught in there, bacteria gets caught in there, and it can cause pain and gas and issues. Um, polyps, these are gross within the intestine, particularly the large intestine. Polyps need to be looked at and regularly checked to make sure that they're not precancerous and causing colon cancer. Uh, you can also have things like Crohn's disease and colitis. These are inflammations within the intestine that can cause issues. So if you have a sudden change in bowel habit, A, first thing that you're going to be asked to do by the doctor is take a diary of what it is that you're ingesting and when something might be happening. How often you poop, what the poop's like. So if all of a sudden for a few days you're having intestinal issues, maybe it's a week, to go to the doctor with uh, uh, your arsenal of information to make sure that they then have a full picture because otherwise they're just going to send you away to do the diary, the food diary um, and the symptom diary and then come back in a couple of weeks. So preempt it, go in with the information. To check the intestine, they do what is called a colonoscopy. The colonoscopy goes up the anus with a camera on a horse and the difference between the sheep, they're both herbivores, but the horse is a trickle feeder, means it's constantly eating little by little by little. So it's constantly feeding its digestive system. Whereas this um, sheep is a ruminant, it has multiple stomachs. So again, this is the um, sheep digestive system, this is the horse digestive system. The difference between them, ruminant is the sheep, meaning it's got multiple stomachs, and the horse has um, a trickle feeder, it's eating little and often. So, in a um, sheep, we have the trachea, and then running underneath it, we have the esophagus. You can see here that this is the pluck, these are the lungs, underneath here is the heart, and then this is the liver, and this here is the trachea. The trach is obviously reinforced with rings of cartilage, and it is rigid. But in comparison, 
This is the esophagus of this sheep, and you can see how flexible it is. You can tie it in a knot, right? It is a very flexible tube. And the reason why it is so flexible is to allow for peristalsis to occur, to move the food bolus, what it's eating, on down. Again, there are sphincters. There's a little sphincter up on the top here, and there is a sphincter down on the bottom before it goes into the uh, stomach. Now these stomachs are pretty cool because they have different rouge contractions for each of them. So if you see here, this one is pretty neat. It looks like honeycomb or brain coral, can you see? This is the inside of one of the stomachs. The inside of another stomach, let's see here. There's a spleen again. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I've got a, this one here is full of seeds. These remind me of the villi in our small intestine. The fact that these here are little projections that increase the surface area. There's another one that's like that with slightly bigger um, seeds. This one doesn't have as many seeds. And then I'm trying to find my favorite one. It always eludes me to the last moment. And then it pops out and goes, here I am. How many stomachs are there? It has, I believe it has four. This is my favorite. Are you ready? It looks like the Kraken from the um, Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Do you see? How cool is that? It's a stomach, uh huh. So it's got layers and it looks like it's got little teeth on it and everything. And so it grinds up. So it's got these different stomachs. So basically, the food gets ground up in one stomach, it moves on to the next stomach, it moves on to the next stomach. In some of these ruminant animals where they have multiple stomachs, they actually have a regurgitation stage in between. Um, gorillas. They, you may notice, that they eat their food, they vomit it into their hand, and then they eat it again. And the second time that they eat it is actually sweeter and tastier for them. Because remember, in the saliva, they're breaking down the starch. And as they break down the starch, it becomes into more of a sugary product. And so therefore, the sugar becomes sweeter, and it, they enjoy it a second time. So gorillas actually, yeah, do that. Cows, they, when I said you chew on the cud, that's basically their vomit, that they've chewed and eaten the uh, grass, and then they upchuck it to chew it again to have a second round, because they've broken it down, now they're breaking it down even further, and then swallow it to their multiple stomachs. Again, you can see here, this is the small intestine. There is a lot of it, all right? This is plentiful, but the small intestine is, once again, very thin-walled. The uh, mesentery is there. The mesentery is thick, and it's in between each of the bowel loops, which will allow for holding it in place. It allows for the uh, so connective tissue, nervous tissue, and vascular. Vascular means blood tissue, okay? Can you see behind me? All right, okay. Um, Large intestine, once again, this large intestine is thicker. The point of the large intestine is to absorb the water. Now, this dude here has a um, kind of cool cecum. It is like, it reminds me of a Rastafarian beanie. Do you see what I mean? Goes, no? Uh, am I the only one? Okay, so it is, it goes in like circles. This one's... Um, it goes round and round and round. This is the cecum of this animal. It is much reduced than the cecum of the horse, yes? Now, after it goes, the, so the cecum connects the small intestine to the large intestine. After it goes through the large intestine, it is going to go into this enormously long rectum. Why do you think this organism has an enormously large rectum? What does a sheep eat? Grass. Grass, okay. Do you ever really see the sheep going after and drinking lots of water? No. No. In fact, did you know that koalas, <coughs> koala bears, are actually being trained because they don't drink water. They're being trained to drink water. That's because in Australia right now, they're having huge droughts and the water is not enough within the eucalyptus leaves. And so they're actually training the, um, koalas how to drink from like a bucket of water. It's very interesting. 
All right, I'm full of useless knowledge. So this rectum is really long. Do you know what kind of poo sheep have? Very dry little round pellets and lots of them. Imagine that you're trying to have an enormous amount of poop to leave the sheep, but this was an enormous boulder. Instead of that, they've taken it and made it into lots and lots of little pellets. That way, they can actually store it in this long rectum. The rectum's job is to store and to help remove the last bit of water. Seeing as though they're getting the water from the grass that they eat, they have to extract as much water as possible. Here is the anus. Hello. Right? This is the anus. But what are these? I will give you a clue. This is not a male. What is this? They're not ovaries. They're not testicles. It is not? No. How do sheep communicate? Oh. But, yeah, okay. Um, so, do they have their entire conversations like, but I'm a lovely sheep and I'm ready to mate through barring? No, so, so, through uh, hormones. Hormones. Pheromones. Pheromones. These are scent glands right by the anus. Lots of mammals have this. These are scent glands right by the anus so that they release pheromones, great word, these are smelling hormones, and these can be then telling of sexual desirability to the um, sheep and rams. The ewes will send off a message, the rams will pick it up, and then you have spring lambs. But, um, okay, so same concept here. Esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, anus, sphincters, um, accessory organs, they would have them too. Okay, let's do one last thing. Um, ben, can I ask a huge favour? Yes. Can you go and grab me model Alex over there and um, the extra bits that have fallen out, please? While I try and take my gloves off. So, what, yep, that's fine. Just go ahead and pick that up, that whole thing. Um, so, what we can see, Turn. just Turn. right here, thank you, I'll wipe this off for later. Can you pass me a paper towel, please? Um, what we can see here is, there we have the oral cavity. This is the start of the um, digestive system, and it goes all through the thoracic, thank you darling, the thoracic, through to the abdominal, and the pelvic cavity, thank you, is going to be the terminal portion of the um, digestive system. So, that's beautiful. Oh, you've got the heart as well, that's fine. I just really needed these two. So, what we can see here, what we can see here is that the oral cavity starts the digestive process of a mechanical and a chemical breakdown. We changed the battery already. Yep. Um, salivary glands right here located three pairs and then it comes down the esophagus you can see that this is the esophagus here as well the esophagus is the flexible tube it goes through the diaphragm and it goes to the connection between the stomach this lower esophageal sphincter is also called the cardiac sphincter it goes into our j-shaped pouch of our stomach it's moving around continuously so we have mechanical and chemical breakdown internally we have the rouge here which increase the surface area grip and ability to produce our enzymes it goes on down through the uh, stomach and it goes into the duodenum now you'll notice this is the liver you can see it is lobed and underneath this is the uh, gallbladder and you can see the ducts that are associated the cystic and hepatic duct that goes to the common bile duct this here is the pancreas the pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ sitting behind the stomach this is the head of it nestled into the duodenum this organ right here, this is the spleen, which we mentioned as well. From the duodenum, it goes into the jejunum and the ileum. It then goes into the um, cecum. Attached to the cecum is the appendix, a dead-end vestigial organ. 
The cecum is the first portion of the large intestine. From there it goes up the ascending colon to the transverse colon to the descending colon to the, and you can see it here, there is a wiggle. This wiggle here is the sigmoid colon and then it goes back into the rectum which is the storage portion back here and then out the anus which would be here. In order to move poop, you use your abdominal muscles, the muscles within your intestine for peristalsis, as well as a brain connection to the sphincters to help make sure things move along. Okay? What questions do you have for me? None? Did I explain it so well? Goodness gracious! As I did say, this is my favourite. So if you ever have any questions about your intestines, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Here end this, the three comparisons. Oh, uh, just in a quick side note, did you notice the length of the cecum in both of these? And this large intestine, much longer than ours, because they needed more gut flora. How quick do you think the digestive system would be of a lion? Rapid, because it does not want to contain the uh, food inside the intestine very long because it will ferment and then be problematic they could explode. Rotted food. Kabooey! Be a problem. Alright, thank you very much everyone.